Hare Krishna. Can all of you hear me clearly? So I'm grateful to be here with all of you today. As you mentioned, after many years, of course, the youth center is both a soul and a body. So it keeps changes bodies according time, place, circumstance. <laughs> the soul remains the same. Now I am seeing it in a different body, reincarnated in a different form according to the need of the situation. So I'd like to start by asking all of you, what do you understand by the word modes? All of you have probably heard it before. So what do the modes mean to you? Yes, please. The state at which we are. The state at which we are. By state, you mean psychological state, emotional, physical state, what kind of state are you talking about? Or overall state or what? A state is a very broad word, isn't it? So, you could say state at which we are, could be financial state it could be. It could, <laughs> it could be geographical state, which state are we in? So, what are we referring to? Emotional state, spiritual. Okay, you could say spiritual state. Emotional. <laughs> Emotional, okay. Emotional or we could say psychological or emotional state. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. Thank you, that's a fairly good point. Anything else? Yes, please. Uh, I heard modes means also ropes. Uh, okay. So ropes, what do they bind? What do they bind? They, are, they, they make the jivatma uh, condition. Conditions are in different ways. Okay, so the ropes bind the soul to what? When you are bound, we are bound by something. Yashoda might bound Krishna in Damodha Leela. He bound to what? A grinding mod, isn't it? So, if somebody is bound, they are bound to something, isn't it? Of course, you can say somebody is bound and if their hands bound, they are running away. That is also possible. But, so are we bound to something? Material to? to this world, material world. Yeah, could say just too broadly to matter. Nibad the verse says, Dehe, Dehinam, so Dehe and Dehinam. The soul is bound to matter or to the body. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Yes. If behavior imposed upon us, which is not a default. Behavior imposed upon us. So are you saying we have no free will? If it's imposed. Okay, let's look at this word imposed. So the more words impel some behavior, impose some behavior on us or impel us. So I prefer the word impelled. You have heard the word impelled? Impulse you have heard? So impulses, the government. Impelled. So behavior that is impelled through us, that's true. So it's almost as if something other than us is pushing us to act in particular ways. So that is the modes. Yes, that's a good point. Anything else? Can you medium? Medium. Medium for what? Um, as in modes of transport, so like medium, uh, state you are in or a different medium or different platform you are in. Okay, so you are using the word modes right now in a general dictionary sense. Okay. So was that all of your thinking? Okay. <laughs> I, okay, that's an interesting connection. So the word modes refers in say, okay, what mode of transport are you going from the city to the another city? So mode sometimes refers to medium or means. So let's see how that relates with the concept as explained in the Gita. That's a creative interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a criticism. <laughs> okay, okay. So 
it's a thank you anyone else has any points yes please Probably like condition and environment, like we tell silent mode, airplane mode, like we tell, so maybe environment or conditions in which we are put. So the modes subject us to certain conditions or environments. That's an interesting way of looking at it also. It is definitely having some truth to it. That's also. We are going on a creative journey now. <laughs> so, oh, okay. so, yes. The modes are a very widely referred to concept and yet they are not so very easy to pin down precisely. So we will be having four sessions and I'll be discussing this chapter 14 of the Bhagavad Gita. And in that, while we will go, we won't go over each of the verses in the chapter. We'll discuss some of the verses. But broadly, today I will introduce the concept of the modes, what they are. Then tomorrow I will talk about the effects of the modes. Effects in terms of the characteristics of the modes. Hmm. Then later we will talk about transcending the modes. And in this, depending on how much the discussion goes, we will be talking about it in two parts. One will be through analysis. The other will be through devotion. So broadly, the concept of the modes is explained for 14.1 to 10. The effects of the modes is described from 11 to 20. And transcending the modes is described from 21 to... Broadly, the section goes from 21 to 27. The last verse of this chapter. So you could say 26, 27 is through devotion. And 21 to 25 is through analysis. So we'll maybe spend one, one session on analysis, another session on devotion. We'll see how that part goes. But this is what we'll be covering over the next four days. So before we can understand the concept of the modes, uh, let's try to understand in what context the Gita is talking about the term modes. In general, Whenever we talk about a, one language to another language, mm -hmm. there is, if you are going to speak in one language and the audience understands another language, what do we need in between? Translation. translation. Now, in general, every translation is a transformation. Why? Because Every word that we speak is having a particular significance in the original language. And that may or may not be conveyed in another language. So now, can there be precise translations? Well, it's possible, but it's, it's difficult. So over a period of time, people start understanding it. That's why we will see now, in today's world, many terms from Sanskrit and the Vedic tradition have become mainstream in the English language. Can any of you give some examples? Dharma. Dharma. Karma. Dharma. Karma. Karma. Guru. Guru. Yoga. Yoga. Kirtan. Kirtan. Okay, yes, Kirtan is definitely. Moksha. Moksha. Well, uh, not that much, but it is there. Uh, definitely. Samsara is actually much more common. That samsara, especially among yoga circles, people have this word. Now there are, in each language, <coughs> there are words that are considered non-translatables. That, actually the one word you missed, there's a big Bollywood movie series, Hollywood movie series by that name. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So now avatar, you don't have to go to Hollywood also. Every digital social media has our own avatar, <laughs> isn't it? So the, each of these words has a certain meaning to it, which is very difficult to convey in another language. And that's why those same words are taken and then they are explained. So the Sanskrit word guna, which is used in this particular, which is, for, which is how modes are translated, which is, which is translated as modes. Actually, as some of you mentioned, the word mode has certain meanings in English, 
that really does is not conveyed by the which is different from the meaning of the word modes so we will while we are discussing talking of the modes we will mostly use the word guna and also i will not use goodness passion ignorance i'll be using satwa adas tamas i'll explain as we move forward uh, how these words have certain connotations today which are different from what the sanskrit conveys so basically words have two features to them one is the denotation and the other is the connotation has anyone heard these two words before denotation if you have heard the word denotation denote you have heard denote okay connotation anyone has heard no so probably you didn't know this is this class is going to exercise your vocabulary muscles also <laughs> <laughs> so basically what is the idea of denotation and connotation see if there is a person this put the person said over here and <laughs> there is a object so a word is like a link between the person and the object so when i use a word i refer to a particular object and then by that i can others can also know what i'm talking about so maybe a year or two ago there was this whole issue about is india being renamed as bharat should the renaming be done india is still going to have its poverty its corruption its problem so what the, what is the use of changing the name a whole debate debate came up so at that time i had made a elaborate video about this point that there is the object that is being referred to so the word in terms of the object is a reference but the word with respect to the person brings remembrance so the name god and the name krishna they both refer to the same ultimate reality but god and krishna they evoke different remembrances within our mind isn't it so the the what is being referred to is the same but what we are reminded of is different and there are times when what we want to remember needs to be changed and if that's what we want to change then changing the term can be helpful it doesn't change the reality in itself immediately but it changes which aspect of reality we are referring to see the same person who may be your close friend you now when we meet another friend in a informal get together might just refer to the friend by uh, by their first name or even by their nickname but that frame friend there is a business meeting and we are introducing that friend we will say okay this is will refer to the full name will refer to the surname will refer to the designation so is it it so you may say oh, and i have informed that this is my friend raju now in a business meeting this is my friend raju <laughs> we would say that is it <laughs> so this is my friend mr rajendra rosa chattopadhyay whatever <laughs> so the idea is that the term that we use it brings certain connotations with it so the words have connotations and denotations what they denote is what they denote connote is what they remind us of and that's why in our tradition we also have primary and secondary names of krishna so what do the terms remind us of that is important so similarly the word guna what first of all we try to understand what does this concept mean what is it the reference what is it referring to and so if this is complicated don't worry i'll make it much more complicated <laughs> mm. so with respect to the modes first which is the chapter of the gita that we are discussing that you remember right now 14 chapter okay how many chapters of the gita have 18. 18 chapters so right now we are in the we could say the four, 1 to 6 7 to sorry 1 to 6 then we have 12 to 18 so we are in the third half of the gita what is the section called then you know 
The Gita has three sections. Yeah, it, has a, it is the Jnana section of the Gita. So, now there are, diff, what is the second section said to be about? Bhakti, Bhakti, Bhakti section. The first section is about Karma, karma, karma section. Yeah. Now there are two broad metaphors which have been used by commentators to explain the Gita's flow. So one is the ladder metaphor. Jabal. Sorry? Jewel box. Jabal? Jewel box. Jewel box. Okay. Jewel box is used to talk about how certain verses are the culmination. That is what is used, that is say, that 1865 and 1866, Chakravarti says is the culminating verse. So, jewel box is used. I am talking more about the flow of the Gita. So, one is the ladder and the other is the spiral. So, ladder means what basically? The verse, the Gita is flowing in a particular way. There are rungs in a ladder by which we move upwards. The other is that the Gita is flowing towards a particular point. Now, what this means is that it's the, we are here. If this is the point the Gita is coming towards, so the Gita is coming towards this point from one way, from another way, from a third way. So, one way is that Karma Yoga, Gyan Yoga, Bhakti Yoga are like steps on a ladder. The other is Karma Yoga, Gyan Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga are both, all three, means to the same ultimate purpose. Now both these metaphors have been used by commentators in our tradition and we are going right now into those metaphors. But the point is Krishna is discussing Jnana. Jnana itself is, he is doing elaborate analysis. And what is the purpose of that analysis? The purpose is freedom from illusion. Generally, whenever we have knowledge. So knowledge, it can have different purposes. In the Vedic tradition, the purpose of knowledge is freedom. Freedom from illusion so that we can go towards liberation. Liberation from matter, basically. Now, in the modern context also, we could say <coughs> the knowledge has similar purpose. But the mode the, or the, the, the approach is very different. It is not it is not liberation from matter as it is control over matter. The whole point of knowledge, for example, if you consider in science, is that through science we understand technology. Through technology we can gain better control over matter. All forms of technology is essentially this. So we learn how motion occurs and we have cars and we have planes and we have spacecrafts we understand how information is transmitted and then we have telecommunications so now this is not necessarily a bad thing you know, controlling itself is not a bad thing a guru control the disciple parents control their children here the important thing is why are we controlling so Arjuna is an archer and he's a very good archer what does that mean he has precise control over where the arrow will go when he shoots it. So, sometimes controlling mentality itself is going to be a bad thing. Well, the word has a negative connotation. But, controlling for what purpose? That is the important thing. Like, if controlling mentality is bad, then why are we told to have sense control? <coughs> is it having sense control a matter of controlling mentality? Is it? No, we want to have sense control so that we can serve Krishna better. So, it's not that science intrinsically is bad, but the purpose of knowledge in the Vedic context is somewhat different from in the modern context. In the modern context, the idea of a non-material reality has been largely rejected. So, their idea of freedom is, we will get freedom by absolute control over matter. So, yes, matter controls us and that's a problem. But here, the idea is freedom will come by absolute control over matter. So, if we get knowledge of how the aging process occurs, then we can find the genes which cause aging. Then we can manipulate those genes and then we can stop the aging process. That is of course the fairy tale. But, <laughs> but that's the whole idea. So, if you understand 
the how conception occurs. Then we can have the man take a pill, the woman take a pill, or the man do some surgery, by which there can be physical union with no conception. Then we can deal up, get rid of the problem of birth. So the idea over here is that control is being sought. So, the, so jnana in the Vedic context is not for control. It is for it's not controlling matter, but for freeing ourselves from matter, liberating ourselves from matter. Now, for that purpose, Krishna will explain how do we get entangled in matter in the first place. And the modes are a part of that explanation of the mechanism of entanglement, the mechanism of illusion. They are part, parts of. So, I was in America, I had many class, many uh, lectures in many different colleges. So, uh, as I was going for a program, and I asked the devotees, okay, which college am I going to now? See, this, this is the American Institute of Illusion. <laughs> <laughs> it's actual college by that name. <laughs> and it is a college where people are trained to make movies. So, the idea is that you have to create illusions. And in the many movies, when I made thousands of movies may be made, but many of them flop. And why do they flop? So because? They are not creating proper illusion among human beings. Yes, the illusion is unsatisfactory. <laughs> <laughs> so people want to escape from the world. And when they can't escape, then the characters are not relatable, the action is not realistic, the dialogues are artificial, the whatever it is there, then if it is, the illusion is boring. So actually, creating illusion is no laughing matter. To create a illusion that actually puts people into illusion. It's a remarkable feat. It's a remarkable feat of intelligence, of creativity. And most movies fail in that. That's our fortune. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise people would just stay completely captivated all the time. But the fact is that in some ways when we understand the mechanism by which illusion is created, then we can guard ourselves from it. We can also understand the subtlety, the complexity of the mechanism. If we watch, if you are watching, uh, say on a laptop, some movie, then it, it just grip us completely. Now, even if with our engineering minds we understand that actually it's just a series of pixels over there, but you know, that doesn't really help much. Okay, it's all pixels, but it's all very attractive. <laughs> so, but at, at the very least, we understand it. So, for us, understanding how illusion is created is helpful. Of course, that is not the only way to get out of illusion. So, the modes are a part of a mechanism. Now, the mechanism is quite complex, but Daiviya Esha Gulamai Mama Maya Duratyaya. So, Krishna says the Maya is Gulamai. Gunamai means it is full of modes. Mai means full of, like Anandmaya. Full of Anand. The Chinmaya is full of consciousness. So, so Gunamai means filled with Gunas. It is made of the Gunas. So, the word Guna can be understood. I will take three different metaphors to understand this. And each metaphor conveys one particular aspect of the illusion. Say, to understand this metaphor, let's see there's a child. And the child is watching a TV. Maybe the parent, maybe the parents have a home where they have a home theater. You seen this? It's like this home theater, when I first saw it, it's like, really? You want to convert your home also into a place of illusion. <laughs> so, the theater is a good illusion. It's, uh, people have such, people have such, some, I was in America in one person's home. He was a devotee, thought of becoming a devotee. He had such a huge home and such a huge theatre inside that home. Probably the, the TV screen was probably 100 inches or something like that. It was huge. And he said that, you know, before I came to Bhakti, like, I would just sit, he was born in a wealthy family. They didn't really have to work very hard. He said that, I would sit and just watch for hours and forget the entire world over there. So, 
the whole home theater is constructed in such a way that the the rooms are constructed, the doors are constructed. That even if you have to go to the restroom, the restroom is located in such a way that you can still keep watching the TV. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I suppose if child has a home theater, and uh, I am watching. Now, if you see when the child gets lost in watching, what all is happening? See, first of all, there has to be a movie. That, that something has to be there to watch. Mm -hmm. Then the child has to have some interest in watching it. Now, if there's no interest, if say it's, it's a movie about character, the child doesn't understand, the child doesn't relate with it, then there is not going to be any connection with it. Mm -hmm. Now, along with that, when the child is watching it, there has to be the ambience, the environment. Nowadays, with OTT platforms, almost all movies are available. You can watch in your homes. But still, people pay a lot of money to go to the theatres to watch it. Why? Because the illusion is better. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to enjoy the illusion, we want to have the full experience of the illusion. Like suppose you know some some we are eating prasad and some food is very delicious. And I'm eating the prasad, you know, we are eating. I was just talking with senior devotee. I was senior devotee and asking some questions. And then I was one question after another after another. Then we were talking throughout and finally the time of the desert came. And he told me, no, no, no questions. I'm going to relish this desert. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is that we, if something is enjoyable, we want to immerse ourselves in it. But the ambience can also add to it. So basically, the three metaphors that I'll use to explain the modes. The first metaphor is of colors. So Prabhupada also uses the metaphor. Everything that we see on a digital screen, it's RGB or RYB depending on technology. Just three colors. But three colors combine together and they lead to a whole panorama of pictures and scenes and movies. And it, it can just go on endlessly. If you think about it, just three colors, how much variety can be created through that? So this metaphor of colors basically talks about the gunas as, okay, let's put it here, this side, have space. Gunas as the building blocks of material nature. So like what we watch on a movie screen, it's built with some blocks. And the building blocks are uh, the pixels over there, the, the different color pixels. So the idea is the modes are the building blocks of material nature. That's one way of looking at it. Now, the other, we will look at each of these metaphors a little bit. The other is ropes, what you already mentioned. Now, the rope metaphor conveys something else apart from See, in one sense, the illusion on the screen is created by the technology. Mm -hmm. But when we are in the movie theater, now we can look at the movie, we can look at the person sitting next to us, we can look at the audience in general, we can look at various places. But it's like we are pulled to look towards the movie. Almost our attention is pulled towards that. So the ropes convey the idea of, so colors is the first part. The ropes, the more than ropes, convey the idea of the pull of consciousness towards matter. That not only is illusion created by the modes, not only are the illusory objects created by the modes, but also our consciousness is pulled towards it. So this pulling idea that the modes are not like a TV, if the modes were just like colors, and the TV might be on, but it's not that anybody is pulling us towards the TV. Sometimes the TV is on, we are doing our own work at other places. But the modes are not just like passive creators of illusion. They are also active agents that pull us towards the illusion. So the building blocks idea is a bit more passive. And the, the idea of ropes is a much more active idea. It's pulling us. The third metaphor, 
So something is pulling your attention there now. <laughs> Someone is coming in. Maybe some of you can move ahead. Somebody else is going to come in later. The third metaphor. Now many metaphors could be used to explain the modes, but I'm right now we're trying to understand how we become bound. And that context, how the illusion is formed, and how the modes are an integral part of the illusion. That's what we're discussing. The third is gears. Now by gears, I'm not referring to the gears and the levers and the pulleys and all that that make a machine. I'm referring to gears as a car is moving in first gear, a car is moving in second gear, a car is moving in third gear. So the car, when say a car is moving in a particular gear, it will move in a particular way. When a vehicle, if you are using a cycle, now the cycle also comes with gears. So if you put a cycle in a particular gear, it like, you know, it's a, suppose you are using a cycle in a gear which is meant to go on a high cliff, on a high, steep incline. Then you push and the paddle moves in a different way. So the flat surface you use on a different gear, the paddle moves in a different way. So gears, this what can be, the idea over here is like these are pre-existing flows. It's I'll explain this a little bit more. Say if first person is in a boat. Becoming a little messy. We'll go down. Say if a person is in a boat. Now in a river, there might be currents moving. One current is moving in this direction, another current is moving in this direction, other current is moving in this direction. Do you understand the word currents? That, that not electric currents. Currents is the flow of water. So in a river, water is moving in different directions. And especially nowadays we have machine operated, battery operated, fuel operated uh, devices or uh, vehicles in water. But in the past when people had to physically use oars, then it is vital to catch the right current. We also use the metaphor that spiritual life is like swimming upstream. So going against the current is very difficult. It may be possible, but it is difficult. So here, here the, in this particular metaphor, it is not so much the mode is pulling us in a particular direction. It's more that there are pre-existing flows. And if we get into one flow, we'll go in one direction. We can go in another direction, but it will be much more difficult. If we get into another flow, we'll go in another direction. So these are pre-existing flows. And that's how, so for example, this is primarily associated with ambience. So going back to this, say, going back to this metaphor, so, the, what is there on the TV that is created by the modes, the modes are the building blocks of nature. The interest that the child has, that is also created by the modes. That's why the consciousness goes in particular directions. But the place itself has a particular ambience. Now, if a friend says, okay, you know, I got an exam tomorrow, I want to study. You know, I, I, I want to study, I want to concentrate fully. Okay, I want to go. Where are you going to go? They say, I'm going to a disco to study. <laughs> oh, well, all that it means is your Maya has taken your mind on a disco already. That is, you're just so you're not only going to study the disco. Now, can it possible? Well, maybe for someone it might be possible. Hmm? If somebody is holding a gun at your uh, head and says, "Study," <laughs> then even it's a disco I'll study. Is it? But most of the time, it's going to be difficult. So each place has ambience, and in that ambience, certain activities are naturally stimulated. So it's like there, the flow goes in particular directions. That's why it's important for each one of us, it said that we try to put ourselves in the kind of ambience where the kind of behavior we want is to be sought. So the ambience can be created by the place and the situation in the place. Ambience can be created also by the kind of people we have in that place. So that's how Say, what is the common example of given, given of which place is in which mode? Forest is in? Goodness. Cities are in passion. In ignorance. Well, I'm not sure whether that is always true. It's possible. It's like, forest can also be passion. If a tiger is chasing you, you won't be in goodness, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so the idea is, okay, when we, 
I think more precisely, it's like we are using a forest which is like free from danger, it's just nature, peaceful. It's more like a park rather than a forest. Yeah. <laughs> nature, if you just go into the, uh, like a, the uncontrolled, the forest that has never been tapped by humanity at all, that's not a very peaceful place. A snake might come and bite from somewhere, there might be dangerous insects. So, relatively speaking, it is possible. See, the Kshatriyas in the past, you know, their responsibility also to keep certain parts of the forest free from dangerous animals. That's how the sages could meditate over there. The forest is a place of brutality in many ways. Jeevo, Jeeva, Se Jeeva. One life in the form of another life as survival of the fittest. That's what Darwin talked about. So, it can also be very much a place of passion. But there are areas in a forest which could be places of goodness. Now, similarly, in a city, if there are parks, the parks could be a place of goodness. Or if you go to a library in a city, that could also be a place of goodness. Now, depending on the ambience that is created, actually, the place can have, the, uh, uh, the place may be in a different mode. I was just about one week before in UK, and whatever else the British did, you know, in the cities, in all the major cities, right in the middle of the city, they have created big parks. Like I, we have a temple in Soho. It's like an amazing uh, panorama of material nature is there. It is, a temple is in, right, opposite temple, is not just a bar, it's a gay bar. Uh, right opposite of the temple. And then right next to the temple is all kinds of things that there, there are. So it is, it is the place for the like the peak nightlife over there. But then you just walk about 100 steps and it's one of the most beautiful parks I've seen. Very serene, very peaceful. It's almost you feel as if you come to a different part. Of course, if you go inside the temple and the behold the retreats, that's beyond goodness also. But the point is that in a city itself, not everything is in one place, one mood. It depends on the ambience of the place. So one place could one uh, you know one place could be Tamas, and another place just a few distance away could be Satu. Now of course, whether a person after going there will actually be Satvik, that depends. Some people may go to a park just to be close to nature. They will be in Satwa. Somebody may go to a park to pursue a romantic relationship. Now, Sattva is the last thing on their mind at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, this brings us to another important point that while a place may be in a particular mood, but place may have a particular guna associated with it, that does not necessarily mean that everybody in that place will be in that guna. So, we'll come to that part now. So, when we have to understand the modes, see that, so the gunas, they do three things. They are the building blocks. That they, they are the very foundation of illusions are created. They are like pulling ropes. They are pulling forces. All forces pull, but some forces push also pulling forces. They pull in particular directions. And they are pre-existing flows. So by pre-existing flows, you could refer to the ambience, like a child is watching TV. Uh, is it in a movie theater? Is it a theater, home theater? Is it in a place where a lot of noise is there. But you could take the pre existing flow also like to refer to, like on a TV there will be many different channels. Now if somebody is watching a Discovery Channel and somebody is watching say MTV, is MTV even existing now as a channel? Not there, okay. So whichever, whichever, whichever say Rajasik channel might be there. So it all, so like there are pre-existing flows going on there. The person goes on Discovery Channel relatively speaking, They'll be thinking, learning, some curiosity is there. It may be a little more sattvic. If somebody is watching say, this WWF fighting, so it is Rajasik going down to Tamasik very fast. So it depends. So there are pre-existing flows. So the, the modes in that sense are complex. So it's a whole mechanism of how illusion is triggered within us. And in the Bhagavad Gita, now if you consider among these three things, which among these is changeable for us? So the Gita focuses on like Nibadnanti Mahabaho, that's what the Gita says, Dehe Dehi Namome. So the verse which recited, which of the aspects of the modes is being focused on? 
among these three in that particular verse? Nibandanti means the ropes, the pulling forces, isn't it? So now if you consider among these three, actually only this is changeable for us. The modes as the building blocks of material nature, they are always going to exist. We may become purified, we may become liberated, but the material world is going to exist as it is. And we may stop watching movies, but movies are still going to be produced. So people will always need some kind of entertainment and different people will see different kinds of entertainment. <clears throat> so now we can say the building blocks can be changed to some extent. Maybe majority of the movies could be Satvik and some will be Rajasik and Tamasik. Maybe some will be Rajasik and majority will be Tamasik. That may change. We'll talk about that later. But in one sense, these two are unchangeable. Similarly, pre-existing flows. These are also going to exist all the time. Sattva Rajas Tamas is always going to exist in material existence. So, so in that sense, we can't change material nature. We can only change how much it pulls us. So if a rope is there pulling us in a particular direction, we can cut off that rope. We can weaken that rope. So the concept of the modes is in that sense a multi-level concept. In fact, the next chapter itself. So in this verse itself, you could say, and Krishna uses the word Nipadnanti. He binds, he's referring to this. But when he uses the word Auvayam, Auvayam is imperishable. If it literally meant that the ropes can never be cut, then there will be no hope for liberation for us. But the modes, the gunas will always exist. But we can choose whether we will be bound or not. In the next chapter, does anyone know what is the next chapter of the Bhagavad Gita? Sorry? Yes, I was asking a question, the same question to uh, in a program in where was it? Australia. And one year is a 15 chapter. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. um, so, the next chapter is about Purushottam Yoga. There the metaphor is of the Urdhva Mula Madasha, of the upside down tree. And there also in that metaphor, it's emphasized that we can never cut off the tree. We can only cut off our entanglement of the tree. That's why, Krishna is there also uses the same word which is used over here. Urdhva Mula Madha Shakam Ashwatham Prahur Auvyayam. So the same word Auvyayam that is used over here is also used over there. So the tree, again the idea is that illusion is going to exist all the time. But we can disentangle ourselves from the illusion. So the pull of the ropes that is there, that can change. Now these pre-existing flows are going to be there. Sattva Ajastama is going to be there. There will always be bars and brothels and places like that. But we can avoid going into those places. There will always be people in Tamaguna. But we can avoid associating with them so much. So this is broadly the concept of the modes. Now, after introducing the broad concept, when we talk about the gunas, the gunas are of three types. What are the three gunas? Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. So now, Sattvam Rajas Tama Iti Guna Prakti Sambhava, that's what the words are used. Now, what do these words mean? There are different ways of understanding it. So, it is, see the soul, let's put it here, the soul is here. And this is the world of matter. Now, above this is the, this is the material world, this is the spiritual world. And below this, you could see here is the virtual world. Virtual means the imaginary world. So broadly speaking, <clears throat> as it, uh, the modes are like ropes. So the rope of sattva pulls the person's consciousness through matter but upward. Towards something beyond matter. Sat Rajas pulls the rope towards matter only. Whereas Tamas pulls the person through material nature towards even imagination. It's like Tamas. So a person in Tamaguna, 
it's uh, except people who are watching movies and they just lose themselves watching movies. It's a hero and a heroine kiss, move, hug each other or do something, people start whistling. What is happening? Like all living beings look for meeting. But this is not even meeting, it is second hand meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it's somebody else is doing it. And people are imagining if only I would be there, it would be so nice. So it's not even first hand. It's not even Rajoguna. Rajoguna is actually a person tries to control material nature to enjoy it. And Tamaguna is a person is so lazy and the person just doesn't even have the effort or the energy or even the intelligence. Controlling material nature is also not easy. It's it's one doesn't even try. All that they do is just go into an imaginary world. And in an imaginary world, they imagine. So it's just in the head. It's not even physical matter. That's why tamo of alcoholism, it's considered tamasic. It's basically a person is escaping from the physical world to the mental world. Now we could escape in many different ways. This is tamaguna is basically associated with escapism. Escapism can be through our own mind. Escapism can be through substances that we take and that affect our mind. So it could be drugs, hmm? it could be uh, alcohol. But the escapism can be also through others' minds. By others' minds means the product of the others' minds. So movies and novels, what are they? They are products of other people's imagination. And we, we are so lazy that we can't even use our own imagination. To go into an imaginary world, we need somebody else's imagination. <laughs> <laughs> so, broadly speaking, Sattva just tamas. Later on, Krishna will say that the result is also like that. Urdhvam gachanti sattva stava. So, if somebody is sattva, they are still in the material world, but they are thinking about higher things in life. Madhye tishtanti rajasa. So, the Rajoguna, they just want to control material nature. And they, because they have a desire to control, generally they will stay there, where they are. And Adho Gachanti Tamasaha, one will go down. Because one doesn't even have the energy or the intelligence to control material nature. One just wants to escape into their own imagination. They go downwards. So now, if we understand the modes bind, and when the modes bind, they bind in different ways. And Sadhguna also binds. But it is elevated. So broadly, these three modes, if we consider sattva, is it is associated with reflection followed by action. It is a person thinks and then they act. That's the general characteristic of sattva. And say, for example, now there is some in the, the there are concerns about what are we doing to the environment. Maybe we should decrease the pollution. Maybe we should use less plastics. Maybe we should use, decrease our consumption. So people are thinking. That is a good thing. Reflection before action. Nowadays many people before they buy food. Now we as devotees, we don't eat certain foods. That's why we are careful. But even ordinary people now are careful. Okay, when they buy foods, what are the ingredients? Does it contain, I don't want this. I want gluten free food. I want this food. I want this kind of food. But the idea is, there is some kind of reflection before action. That is the character of Satvogana. In Rajas, there is first action and then reflection. It's first I do something and if it doesn't work, oh, what went wrong? <laughs> so in Rajas, you see, if you see previously from the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution started almost a century ago. But for much of that time, the idea of the un underlying the economy was greed is good, big is good. That the bigger the industries we have, the idea is the more we control nature, the more we will be able to enjoy. This is action. But now, and then slowly, when pollution started coming and things started going wrong, then this reflection, oh, have we done the right thing? So there's action, reflection. Now in Tamas, what happens? There is only imagination. Now, imagination is neither really clear action, neither reflection. 
it is all a person's action even if there is action and even if there is reflection whatever it is there it is all directed towards going into imagination it is just to get yes escape from reality so so these are you could say broadly speaking different ways because as it is pre existing flows like gears there are different ways of functioning in the world some people they just they think it and they act some people let's do something let's try it out if it didn't work then we'll try something else and that's also not a wrong way to do it and rajas and tamas should not be equated you see why sometimes we say in bhakti we have to go rajas tamo both modes we got to go beyond that and that's true but from a spirit from a material perspective rajas may be unfavorable but from a material perspective rajas is not unfavorable so rajas is actually very very important for functioning in the world like say a rajasic parent and a tamasic parent after i mean as i said i mean last 10 years i've been going to america and when i interact with american youth i just realize how much scarred they are by childhood upbringing generally when we go to school we may ask a, if you meet a boy a friend you may say a potential friend as well so where do you stay what do your parents do and the question in american schools is with which parent do you stay your mother or your father so it's like almost assumed that the parents are not together and it's it's tra- it's tragic actually in many ways and children get scarred they get terribly scarred and sometimes uh, uh, so a rajasic parent may have no interest in god may have no interest in their children turning towards god but if the child falls sick the parents will move heaven and earth to take care of the child but a tamasic parent the tamasic parent will be so stoned on drugs they don't even know their child they have a child and the child is existing <laughs> this is lost to them i know some young boys even some young girls they said that we actually had to be parents for our parents that we had to take care of our parents and that's too much of a burden to put on a child so bhakti no thakur says that rajoguna can actually be a serious uh, uh, antidote for the poison that is tamaguna because tamaguna is so poisonous that it just people can't function the moon rajoguna is a antidote for that now of course we can say rajoguna is also poison from a spiritual perspective that is true but from a material perspective if say for, for things to work in the material world life is tough there are hundreds of problems and problems need to be fixed practically so if, the, if people are in tamaguna in general nothing in the material world will function at all that say if the power goes off somebody needs to know how to fix the power is it everybody tamaguna everybody is taking drugs <laughs> no nobody knows how to fix things it won't work so rajoguna is important and so in the west nowadays so 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 what i'm going to talk about here is and last point i'll make before i conclude that see the modes while they bind they are important for functioning within the world they are important so satvaguna is important rajoguna is also for the functioning of the world rajoguna is also important so in the west now there is an increasing concern about pornography and that has got nothing to do with spirituality or even morality it is all got to do with basic reproduction because when people's minds are especially male minds are filled with imagination about sex and pornography is all about distorted conceptions of sex what happens in real life even when they are with a the partner they just don't feel excited and then there are cases where men are so addicted to porn that whoever they are with physically they just don't don't get aroused and if they don't get aroused and there is no reproduction there is no reproduction humanity will get extinct so and then of course the, there was a lot of concern about population explosion in the past now a big concern is population implosion especially in the west if there had been no immigrants going from various countries then the west population would have gone steep graph downwards 
So Japan is now actually paying parents to have children. So every child you have will pay you for that child. Because it's, it, there are various reasons. I'm not saying porn is the only reason. But my point is that there are many people just for functional reasons. They're saying that this is just terrible. Because it's just that leave alone all morality. Just basic functionality becomes impaired by that. Now men are attracted more by images. Women are attracted by more by words. So there is a whole genre of novels called poor man's. Poor man's means what? It's, it seems like the simple romantic novels. But if you, inside those novels, the descriptions, verbal descriptions, are so ter terribly explicit. And women are addicted to that. And most of the times, the woman, uh, wife might be with her husband, but she's imagining some other man only. So it is even material functionality cannot be there. If Tamoguna is there. So Rajoguna has its problems, but Tamoguna is like a poison. Now we may say that if Tamoguna is so bad, then why is Tamoguna present at all? So, so, however, it is not that Tamoguna is bad. It is being disproportionately Tamoguna that is bad. See, all these three modes, they serve their own purposes. What is the purpose? That what are the three modes, the three functions of the material nature? What are the three functions? Creation, creation and, destruction. and which is which mode is associated with what? Creation. 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 Sattva with? Maintenance. Maintenance and? Destruction. Destruction. So now, actually in material nature, all these three things need to keep going on. Tamoguna is not a wrong, practically, Tamoguna is not a bad thing. If somebody is not able to sleep, it's a big problem. Yes. Insomnia is a serious issue. There's one person with insomnia, he said that my bed is like a magical place. As soon as I get onto it, I remember all the things that I did not do throughout the day. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't sleep. So actually, uh, sleep is a mystery in many ways. That many things about it. There are bestseller books about how to sleep well. Yeah. No, why? I mean, the many reasons for that. Sleeping is actually vital for health. But the thing is, many people for anxiety, attachment, whatever reasons, they're not able to sleep. And if we can't sleep, our body doesn't rest. So in one sense, when we sleep, it is the moment. So and. That is a part of the biological rejuvenation of this body. And that's one of the reasons when if somebody travels too much, uh, there's, there's a body and circadian rhythm. And if somebody goes from one time zone to another repeatedly or very rapidly, then there is jet lag. People just can't, their body cycles get disrupted. So the thing is that Tamoguna itself was not bad. It is Tamoguna that enables us to sleep. So. I was talking with one uh, Prabhupada disciple, he likes to have a lot of, he does body play, likes to have fun. So, I, uh, we were having some discussions, so, uh, how long do you think we can, can we continue the discussion for some more time? Okay, I was asking him that. <laughs> so he said, oh, it is time for you to surrender to Krishna in the form of the Mona. <laughs> What does that mean? Yeah, it's time to sleep. It's a very philosophically eloquent way of saying it. It's time for me to surrender to Tamoguna in the form of sleep. So the idea is, Tamoguna is also not a bad thing. Tamoguna is required. But the problem is, being too much in Tamoguna. Each of these modes is required. See, we, we, we all in, our, in the course of our day need to create some things. So, creating things that requires some Rajoguna. So it is not so much the mode is the problem. The mode, no mode, no mode is the problem. The problem is dominance by a mode. When that mode becomes too much within us, that's when it becomes a problem. Nature has this cycle, creation, maintenance, destruction. And we live in the material world, things grow old and they need to be destroyed. So destruction is a vital function also. So basically what happens is, when we are sleeping, it's, it's mysterious. 
at one moment we are awake and next moment we just sleep. Now we may be tired, we may be resting, we may be closing our eyes. But that particular moment, it's almost like a switch goes off. And that switch is not in our control. <laughs> Sometimes you may lie down for hour or hours and still sleep doesn't come. And sometimes the switch just goes off and you don't want it to go off also. <laughs> so the idea is that there is something beyond just our choosing to sleep. So this is Tamoguna. So all the modes have their place, but inordinate influence by any mode is a problem. So in tomorrow's session we'll discuss the characteristics and the effects of the modes. I'll summarize what we discussed today. Broadly, we are talking about the concept of the gunas. And first, I started by talking about the idea of non-translatables. That certain concepts are non-translatables because when you talk about words, they have denotations and connotations. What they are referring to and what they are reminding us of. So it's better to understand the concept and then see what term to use it. Otherwise, the term can block our understanding of the concept only. Because if the term might remind us something else. So these are so the word guna is what we're using. Then we, while understanding the guna, we talked about the guna in, guna in three different aspects. What are the three aspects? Building, Building blocks of nature. So what are the metaphor for that? Colors. 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 Like a colors in a TV screen. The second was ropes. They are like pulling forces. So the material nature it's not, so this is like more passive. It is the it's created already over there, but this is active. It's pulling us. So if you want to take the movie theater example, there are various movies going on in various places. All those movies are going on. But say if we have a friend who is pulling us, come let's watch this movie. So that is the pulling aspect of it. And then there is there is the pre-existing flows. So the exam metaphor for that is, so here it is, your example was ropes, pre-existing flows. The example is gears. So here it's almost like, as the, the pre-existing flows itself con conveys the point. So it's like there's a multiplex and there are different movies going on. On one side the action movies, another rom-com is there, another horror is there, another kids movie is there. So it's like you have channels. So a channel is on a TV. So it's all going on. So this can refer to the ambience. That is associated with some places, or it could be other arrangements. That it could be like if you have a um, channel or a TV. So basically, the modes are multiple. Among these, which are the ones we, we can change? So the, the pulling force, this is this alone is changeable for us. And then in the last part of the session, we discussed about how when we are looking at the modes, the specific modes. So sattva is, in one sense, from matter towards something higher than matter. Mm -hmm. Rajas is, it's primarily within matter only. And tamas is, from matter to imagination, to escapism. So each of these modes has their own typical functionality. And lastly we discussed that each mode has also its utility. So, First, I talked about generally sattva, we understand its utility already. I talked about rajas, and its utility is that it can be an antidote to tamas. So, in that sense, rajas is very valuable. And tamas is also required for us to rest and to rejuvenate ourselves. The problem is not the mode, the problem is the dominance by the mode. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, please. Could you just like to explain that? Hey Krishna Guruji, would you just like to explain uh, Tamas helps us in rest and rejuvenation and um, insomnia when it happens to a person he is not able to fall asleep quickly or being sleep deprived. Is it by any chance that there is some relation in it? Because in fact the Tamas is acting in the material world but this person is having insomnia because Tamas is not able to act upon this person or can we understand anything in that way? Or is Insomnia dominating over material things in that way. Okay. So, generally speaking, most mental health problems, 
Uh, it's insomnia, mental health problem, it's biological problem, psychological problem, psychiatric problem. I won't go into that at this point. Mm. So the physiological, biological, physiological problem. So it can be any of these things. Mm. But the point is that most mental health problems are associated with tamama. Mm. Like with anxiety. When we have anxiety, what is happening is the imagination is going wild. So right now there might not be much of a problem. There is some problem. But our mind is like, what if this goes wrong, that goes wrong, that goes wrong, that goes wrong. So it is tamogona. Panic attack people get. Now, it is tamogona. Now, of course, that does not mean just tamogona and tamogona. Can, tamogona can also have concrete effects in the sense that people's neurochemical balance in the brain can change. And uh, I know devo even devotees have panic attacks at times. And as one devotee, I was talking with him recently on and he was saying, Say, oh, I'm a preacher, I'm a, I'm a senior devotee, people see me as a leader. And I'm getting these panic attacks. I should be me saying, Bhaja Ure Mana Krishna, Kirinana Abhaya Charana Arvindari. How am I getting this? I said, in, uh, don't get caught in this kind of thing. He says that, see it as a functional flaw of the mind. If suppose you had some, suppose you were giving a class and suddenly you had migraine attack. Then you, you would have to wait, maybe take a pill get the migraine under control, and then you will continue the class, isn't it? Just as the body can have a functional flaw, the mind can also have a functional flaw. So don't take it like a statement of one's character or one's spirituality. These things can happen. Now, can it be also because of that? Yes, some people can be very fearful and timid and they need to overcome their fear. But my point is that yes, it is an effect of Tamoguna, but sometimes the effects of Tamoguna can be, uh, effect of any particular guna can be quite complimentary. And it is not just raw willpower that can be used to overpower it. So sometimes, sometimes nowadays many people find that yoga nidra helps them. They're just trying to do some kind of getting in a meditative state before they sleep. That helps them to sleep. Or some people they may find that taking pills helps. But taking pills, the problem is it creates chronic. It is very easy to get dependent on them. And then maybe for some people they can't sleep at all. Then better they take pills as function. Are able to sleep and wake. Now, the, what kind of pills? That's also important. If the pills are, some pills are really addictive. Some people's pills are not that addictive. When the dosage they require also keeps increasing, it's a problem. So, it's tamaguna, but it can have physiological, pharmacological symptoms, uh, uh, manifestations, and that those have to be addressed appropriately. Hmm. Yes, please. Uh, Prabhuji, uh, sleep, uh, sleep is not in our control, sleeping is. So, how to overcome uh, dozing while chanting when sleeping comes? Well, I think it's, it's, it's an overstatement to say sleep is not in our control. Uh, it is more that probably the quantity of sleep is not in our control. So, if <laughs> <laughs> So, if we don't sleep at the right time, then we sleep at the wrong time. <laughs> so, I think it's important for us as devotees to prioritize. If we are really serious about our japa, it's not just about uh, fighting to stay awake. Mm -hmm. This one American devotee, he said he was, came from a yoga background. And he heard about mantra chanting and his introduction was first through Kirtan. Now in the West, Kirtan is more like a performance than participation. It's like a musical concert. People go and pay. This one devotee does Kirtan and he, this Kirtan, like, he does in a, uh, like a musical hall and people pay $100 for attending a one hour Kirtan. $100, it is a top Kirtan here. So the Kirtan is like a performance. You just sit and hear, sometimes people sing along. But people generally don't dance, they, they feel it's too disruptive dancing. Mm. But anyway, this devotee, he, he heard about mantra meditation, he came to a temple. He, he came to a temple and he, he, had, he attended the mantra meditation, he told me afterwards, he said, you know, I didn't feel it was meditation, I felt it, it was a war. I didn't feel any meditation at all. Now, to some extent, to focus our mind is a war. And the a metaphor of an inner war is quite common, not just in the bhakti tradition, in the yoga tradition also, it is there. But the point is that we should be connecting with the higher reality. 
if all our energy is going in simply disconnecting from Tamaguna, not connecting with Krishna, then <laughs> that's not very, pro very productive use of our time. So we need to yukta ahara viharas, we need to regulate. So generally sleepiness in Japa comes from broadly three factors. One is tiredness, second is sickness, and the third is boredom. So if we are sick, we will need rest. If we are tired, if we are not had enough rest, that's a problem. Now, if we, are, if we find Japa boring, we don't have taste, then we start looking here, there. See, basically, when the mind doesn't find something interesting, it does two things. It moves very fast or it just stops moving. <laughs> <laughs> moves very fast and Rajagoda starts wandering. It stops moving means it puts us to sleep. So, of course, in the dream also, the mind can move. But at the conscious level, it stops moving. So, then we have to create some, that's why we have some Japa talks. We can have some attractive picture of Krishna. Uh, we can try to remember this is the Lord I'm calling out. So we have to cultivate that interest. Okay. okay one last question. Okay, two questions. Yeah. So she mentioned that this pulling forces are changeable. So generally, our mind is also acting under modes only. And the way we are thinking, Correct. it depends on the mode which we are in. So how we can then um, change this? thinking because it is already under most. Well, it's like, uh, it's, that's well, what Krishna, Krishna says that the mind is not the enemy. Krishna says mind can be the enemy, but the mind can also be the friend. So it is like, the point is not what, the mind is not the enemy, what is inside the mind is the enemy. The impurities that are there, the enemy. And those impurities can be removed. You know, one of our friends was in the military, and he was quite active in Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And now Kashmir has become remarkably peaceful. So there's some periodic upsurges are there intermittently, but so how did we do it? You know, it was in Kashmir, there were elements which were totally hostile to India. And those had to be neutralized. Mm -hmm. Neutralized is a politically correct way of saying killed. <laughs> <laughs> so those had to be neutralized. But it is not we India doesn't want that we drop a nuclear bomb in Kashmir and kill everyone over. That's not what is wanted. We want, there are people who are favorable to India, but they need to be supported. They need to be facilitated. They need to see that India is actually our vision. India wants development. India wants our children to have employment. India wants their children to have rights. So then basically, what the forces that were against India were neutralized. The forces that were for India were supported, were facilitated. So like that, it's not that everything in our mind is against Sattva or against Bhakti. There are elements of the mind which are against Bhakti and against Sattva. Those have to be curbed. Those have to be eliminated. And those which are connected with, which are actually connectable with Krishna, those which are pointing us toward Krishna, they are something which you have to support. So it's like if you consider, these are our ultimate interests. Or our, you can say higher interests. Hmm? And these are our present interests, immediate interests. So, we need to focus on this area. And that's how we grow. The whole Varanashram system is not about dividing people into four Varanas. It is about connecting people's present interests with their long-term interests. So, if you are intellectual, then you serve society as an intellectual. You study scripture. You, you learn about ultimate reality through, through, through scripture. So, that's why, see, Rasa, Kshatriyas are considered to some extent Rajaguna. And they are not told you have to come to the Tuvana. Kshatriyas have to fight. And for fighting, you have to be, believe that something is worth fighting. You think the material world is all temporary, whatever happened doesn't matter. <laughs> they are not worth fighting. You know, that is, a Brahmana can have some detachment, a Kshatriya cannot have detachment. Hmm? A Kshatriya has to have, be invested, the word attachment has negative connotation. But Kshatriyas have to be invested in their kingdom sufficiently. Only then they will be, they, they will be ready to fight when it is required. Kshatriyas are not told suddenly come to Satoguna and do Satoguna. Okay, in your Rajoguna, but follow Dharma. Follow Shastra. So basically we have to see where our present interests can connect with the ultimate interests. And that's how we, you could say, we follow a divide and rule policy with our mind. We divide the mind into what is unfavorable. Anukul desa sankalpa, pratikul desya, varjana. So, those interests of ours, 
which are unfavorable to bhakti, we put them aside. Those who are favorable, uh, bhakti or even sattva, a long term well being, material or spiritual. Those we, those who are unfavorable, we, we, we discipline them. We try to eliminate them. Those who are favorable, we nourish them. Okay. Yes, please. Are there any specific verses in Bhagavad Gita which refer to these metaphors or like or Sanskrit words? The word guna, one of its meanings is ropes. So in general, the scripture, Prabhupada explains again the similar metaphor only you can say, a similar visual image. That Prabhupada says this is the message of scripture and this is the interest of the audience audience interest. So Prabhupada says realization means to be able to present the message of scripture in a way that is interesting to the audience. So that is the expertise of the speaker. So Prabhupada uses the car body metaphor. Now there is no such thing as a car that is mentioned in scripture. Car is Mechanical, because the chariot is there, yantra is there, but yantra can be many different things. The car body metaphor is a fundamental metaphor. So, metaphors will always have to be contemporary. And that's why scripture is not just a, like a frozen book. It is a living book. And each generation has to understand and present scripture in a way that connects with the audience. That verse in Prahlad Maharaj's prayers, where it is said that our senses are being pulled in various directions, like a man is pulled by multiple wives. That metaphor is there. The so Prabhupada writes that in the translation it says, the ears are attracted by radio songs. The last time there are no radio songs. <laughs> is it right? <laughs> so what's happening is that. Prabhupada is making that relatable to us. So this is an elaborate subject, but I'll quickly mention it. Generally speaking, there is, in scripture, there are specifics and there are universals. What Prabhupada calls principles and details. There are specifics and universals. Now, the specifics apply to that particular time and circumstance. The universals are time independent. So generally, any kind of communication requires, this is called the ladder, the ladder of abstraction. So at the bottom of the ladder, things are very specific. At the top of the ladder, things are very abstract. So Newton's law of motion, that's an abstract principle. That every particle of matter, or Newton's law of motion, gravity say, every particle of matter attracts every other particle of matter. By X, Y, Z, so and so. That's an abstract principle. But if I take an object and if I drop this pin, that's a concrete example. So generally speaking, understanding requires a combination of specific and abstract. So what happens is we need to go up the ladder and then we need to come down the ladder. So scripture gives us specifics, say from 3000 BC. That's the time when scripture is written. And now we are in 2024 AD. Well, the specifics at that time won't necessarily apply now. And the specifics that apply now won't be there in scripture. So that is why, no, the book cannot be understood by the book. It's the Prabhupada Bhagavata is both the book and the person. The book is understood through the living tradition. And the living tradition needs to have the expertise to communicate the message of scripture in contemporary times. So, can we find uh, verses for every single concept? Well, it depends on what concept, what metaphor. Generally speaking, the metaphors that we use. Say, for example, we may say, uh, okay, Krishna's lips are like a bimba fruit. You may have heard that in the Dhamadra Ashtra, we say, now we don't know what is a bimba fruit. <laughs> so, the metaphor just becomes, uh, it is not very relatable for us. So we need relatable metaphors and it is to expect those metaphors to be found in scripture is itself unrealistic. It's, it's not understanding how scripture works. So the principles have to come from scripture. 
but the illustrations, they have to come from the contemporary world. And that combination of the abstract principles from scripture, from the specific details, see many of us knew Rama and Mahabharata from our childhood. But most of us might have thought, okay, these are nice stories, pious stories. But when devotees draw some life lessons from those books, and then they show how the life lesson applied to us. So from the specific to the abstract, from the abstract to the specific. So this is a journey up and down we need to go on. That only then comprehension occurs. Okay. So we'll continue tomorrow when we discuss the characteristics and the effects of the modes. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gaurabhakta Vrindaki. Gaurabhakta Vrindaki.